Uncomfortable is a series in the Mississippi Book Festival podcast, Right on Mississippi, which is presented in partnership with Mississippi Public Broadcasting. We're so thrilled, well, Miria and the Book Festival, we're so thrilled to have two of the greatest working writers in America and in the world uh, joining us today. They're bookstore and festival friends and favorites, and we're just so honored. Um, Natasha Trethaway's new memoir, Memorial Drive, like Hillary said, came out on Tuesday. And Lemuria has many signed copies um, available for purchase, so buy it for your friends, your family. Natasha is a former U.S. Poet Laureate and the author of five collections of poetry, as well as a book of creative nonfiction. She's held appointments at Duke University, Emory University, the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and Yale. She is currently the Board of Trustees, uh, Professor of English at Northwestern University, and in 2007, she won the Pulitzer Prize in Poetry for her collection, Native Guard. Interviewing the talk today is Kiese Lehman. Kiese is the author of a collection of essays, How to Kill Yourselves and Others in America, uh, the novel Long Division, and Kiese is the recipient of the Andrew Carnegie Award of Excellence for Nonfiction. Uh, for his memoir, Heavy, an American Memoir, and it was also the Audible Audiobook of the Year. Uh, Lemuria has copies of all of these authors' works available for purchase. So please help me in, uh, welcome these incredible authors here today, and I'm going to pass it off to y'all. All right. Hey, Natasha, can you hear me? Yeah, I got you. <laughs> all right. I'm so, so, so happy to, um, I guess, be sharing screen time with you. Uh, I was lucky enough to review Memorial Drive for the New York Times. Um, and so I read it uh, maybe two or three months ago. And it's all I've been able to talk to my friends about. And you know how they send that PDF? They kept on asking me like, man, can you, you know, you got to hook me up. You got to hook me up. I was like, nah, man, I can't, I can't hook you up. You're going to have to wait. Um, but, but one of the things that I said in the review is that it, it's it's not the hardest book to read that I've ever experienced, but it literally is the hardest book I ever imagined writing. And I think if I read that line and I listened to a lot of the other interviews that you've done, I think that people would assume I was just talking about the content, the story that you present, but I was really talking about the way you rendered that story. Mm -hmm. um, it's just so absolutely stunning. And so the first question I really want to ask you, and if you don't want to answer any of these questions, please don't feel like you have to, but I was interested in the use of the comic in this book. Um, for instance, like when I got to that page and you started talking about Jonin and Jankin, mm -hmm. I was, I mean, partially because of what surrounded that, like I was just, like the sound of that word just made me just... <laughs> I mean, I was crying before, but then I just started just laughing. So I'm interested in whether in what role joy and comedy had in the 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 architecture, like the artful creation of this book. I I, I think you're right. I mean, it's just it, it's so easy for um, people to see the the sadness or the trauma in the story, and I think that often means that they miss mm -hmm. the the joy. They miss. Um, the joy that is uh, buoyed by the kind of resilience that I grew up with, the, the, right. the sheer sort of playfulness. Um, I love that you uh, focused on that moment because um, as a Mississippian, you will know Janking. Yeah. Well. <laughs> and so, you know, having to go to Atlanta and lo oh, oh, so it's a different word. Right. All right. So I have to sort of be bilingual between Janking and Joning. Yes. So, um, that sort of similarity of playing the dozens there. Um, I don't think that I could survive if I, if I didn't have joy and laughter. Right. And even, you know, you mentioned some of the other um, interviews I've done where there's so much focus on the trauma and I end up weeping a lot because right. you know the wound is still there it, it doesn't go away and yet there's so much joy in my weeping because I'm happy that I'm just getting to have this conversation about my mother and that you know her yeah. and that people watching will know her um, more than otherwise um, you know I, I this is the same thing with my poetry, I think. There are moments of levity in my poems. Right. But often I think I seem so, you know, 
grave or something that people don't know when I'm actually kind of being a little silly. So yeah. I just really appreciate that you see that. Yeah. Oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> you know, I mean, and I just want, and I'm just gonna let you know, I'm, I'm gonna cry because, <laughs> because I'm an artist. And like, when you see, when you feel, and you're like showered with like incredible for me, Southern black artistry about that relationship. And, and, and like the things that made me cry most in your book were the ways you like tenderly and acutely talked about the playful, yeah. loving relationship with the space, but also with your mother. And yeah. I just think that's also something we don't talk enough about because of what, what, what quote unquote happens. But what happens also is the making of a, like a love, a loving relationship. And I, and again, I just wanted to know, and I think you've, I wanted to know, actually, do you feel like you practiced in some way writing those particular kinds of scenes in some of your previous poetry? Oh, I think so. You know, I, um, I, I always want to go to those moments. You know, one of the earliest poems I ever wrote and actually published um, in a little magazine called First Things uh, that came out of the University of Virginia years ago was a poem about janking you know, sitting on the <laughs> stoop at, you know, Mama Bell's house, janking, and, and just, you know, how the, the, the verbal dexterity that you have to, to master in order to do that, so that you don't, you know, go down a path that is, you know, the wrong path where you're right. saying something, you're signifying in ways that are inappropriate to the game. That's right. so important. And it is one of the ways that I think, um, you know, scholars have written about this, but people witnessing it, you know, if they're from outside the community may not know, that is one of the ways that Southern Black children learn about language and the power of language and what you yeah. can do and who can win because yeah. they can do it the best. Um, yes. Yeah. And, and I felt, you know, th this was, a, you weren't janking when you did this in the book, but I felt this was another kind of, um, effective communication that I rooted in in the in the Mississippi in the Deep South when you when you you, you kind of invert the second person in your diary when you realize that Joel is looking in your diary mm -hmm. and you say you know you go you like you motherfucker like y'all know right. <laughs> right. and for me that was another part of the book where of course it is it's cradled in absolute horror but mm -hmm. it 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 was it was it was it was more than a way of fighting back as a reader I was like, go, you know, go get that. And when your mom starts talking to him and you break the sentences up, like she will not, you know? Mm -hmm. um, do you find any joy in writing those kinds of scenes? Even though there's a larger, I think, horrific yeah. picture. Yeah, that, that is, you know, both of those that you point out were such scenes of power for me. Yes. You know, so my own agency, that moment that I start saying, you know what, that's okay. So you're reading it. So now you're going to have to hear everything I think. You put that's yourself indeed. in this place to listen. So now you have to. Right. And I know you're a captive audience for it. Mm -hmm. um, and that that is a moment where I start to feel like, you know, the world that I'm living in is chaotic for a lot of reasons, but the writing, you know, is a control over that chaos. It yeah. gives me, and I've talked about, you know, domestic work like that, you know, that, you know, that's, that's one of the things when I started writing those things, you know, you couldn't control the thing when you were a child and it was happening to you. Mm -hmm. But when you write about it, when you have the power to take the language and shape it, you are in absolute control over it. And yeah. that is joyful and it is the definition of resilience and Absolutely. hope, I think. Yeah, and you know, I, I so, so, so appreciate the way you, you honor like the collective kind of deep South. And I think that honoring means you look at the particularities of each. So I think the Joni Jenkins is a way mm -hmm. that you all, you say, yes, we're all in some way to Northerners, this blob of folks down here, mm -hmm. but we have different idioms, not just within this region, but within yeah. state. And it made me wonder about this question that I think people ask around a lot when they talk about you. Like, do you think there's a difference between being a Mississippi writer, mm -hmm. a writer from Mississippi, a Southern writer, and a writer from the South. Are there differences in how would you at today, Saturday, it could change tomorrow, describe yourself and of those four? Oh, wow. 
Um, you know, I, I suppose that, you know, I mean, if you add a uh, woman writer, black writer yes. to all of that, you know, I'm all these things at once, you know, and yet there is, I think, language, uh, things like that, that really root you in a particular space. Right. Um, I, I remember taking that, um, that, that test that the New York Times had where you, you, um, uh, you answer uh, all these questions about like how, what words you call certain things yeah. uh, and it can pinpoint your native geography or the geography that where you really learn to speak. And even though I left Mississippi um, when I was six and started first grade in Atlanta, when I took that test, it still located me in the Gulf South. Wow. So that, you know, even wow. though you would think, you know, Atlanta had a, a, a huge impact on, you know, my language, it was still really deeply rooted in Mississippi and the Gulf South. And so in, in that way, I think all of those things, my, my approach to landscape, my approach to um, history is deeply rooted in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. I like that answer. I like that answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm interested also if we could talk about um, the pacing of that book. You know, the people I know who have read it mm -hmm. have all said a few of the same things. And one thing they all said is like, you know, I was in love with that book by the midway point, but there was a point when it just, it, the pacing just picks up and I'm like, oh my God, how could she write a thriller so poetically. <laughs> and so I'm interested in whether you could talk about the pacing of the second half of that book versus yeah. the first and how your poetry, if at all, um, prepared you to, to, to sort of, you know, to handle that pacing. Yeah, that's, that's such a good question. Um, because the two halves are so different. Um, yeah. You know, um, on a personal level, I wanted, if I could have stayed in the first half of the book, I would have. Because, right. well, actually, if I could have stayed in the first chapter of the book, I, I would have, you know. Um, and that probably took me the longest to write because I, th I felt like for the reader, it was really important to understand this place that I had come from, the place, the people how so much of that, I think, prepared me for everything else that was to come. Yeah. Um, that extended family of um, the way that um, metaphor and figurative language become part of my early education, yes. the way that I could hear the differences in how my great aunt Sugar spoke versus how my father spoke versus how my grandmother, my mother spoke. Like all of those things sort of, um, uh, excuse me, were allowing me to imagine going forward into the second half. Um, I also, you know, I would have these moments when, um, before I wrote the book, uh, after Native Guard, that um, uh, I, I would get introduced and I'd have to go up to the, plat the, 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 the podium to read. And some very well-meaning person would say about Native Guard, well, this book is about three things. Uh, uh, the Black soldiers in the Civil War, um, growing up Black and biracial in the Deep South, and her mother's murder. Native mm -hmm. Guard was never about my mother's murder. Mm -hmm. Certainly there are elegies in that book and mm -hmm. my grief and that feeling of loss, but it's not about her murder. Mm -hmm. And yet the moment someone says the word murder, Yes. I've got to make a long walk from my seat up to the podium with right. that word and all the prurient interest that comes with it hanging yeah. in the air. Yeah. So I wanted to get that out of the way, you know, immediately. Let me just sap this of its power, the word murder, and just, you know, let you know that up front so that everything else that comes afterward, you see vivid life. Uh, you see someone vividly alive, vividly trying to hold on to her life, um, yeah. and me vividly trying to construct my own life out yeah. of this devastation, such that um, 
what I hope is that when you get to that second half, even though you know exactly what's going to happen, yeah. you are hoping with every page that she survives this instead. Right. Woo! See, that's, woo! Woo! That's that. I'm sorry, fam. That's, that's it. I mean, I, I just always think the, the, the mark of, 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 and I, I mean, I, I don't even like to use this word master anymore, but right now I'm going to use it because I think you are a master <laughs> of, this, of this language. But the mark of a master is to tell people, this is what's coming. Mm-hmm. But you have no idea how we're going to get there. Mm-hmm. And, I, and, and what's interesting is that the how we're going to get there is really, 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 I think, what this book is about. I, I want to jump for a second and say, you know, Sarah Broom was the first person who talked to me about Memorial Drive. Uh, we were in Jackson doing an event together. Yeah. And she told me at the time, she was like, she, you know, she always called me brother. She's like, brother, you got to read this book. And I was like, for real? And she's like, you got to read this book. And then I think the Times hit me up a few weeks or something after and I read it. And then I, and I hit Sarah back and I was like, sis, why you ain't tell me? And she was like, I told you now. The question is, are we going to get on the road with her? and protect her from these people because you know how they are going to treat her in this book. They're going to say they love it and they're going to focus on the plot and they're going to focus on this particular aspect of the plot. So we ready or not? And I was like, shit, I'm ready. Let's go. So I'm interested in thinking about what it, what it means for you to be doing a lot of talks about this immense artful creation Mm -hmm. from home and not the road. Because I can see how it could be greater and, and, and worse or better and blah, 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 in, in different ways. But can you talk about that? Yeah, you know, I, I, I wonder if I weren't sort of sitting, you know, in this room by myself, if um, I think some of the, uh, what I hope is a public fierceness that I might otherwise have. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, in, in your own home, you feel kind of, cradled in one way right. um, but when i'm on the when i'm on the road whatever i tell myself when i used to be on the road <laughs> i would tell myself um uh and this is always with poetry you know if i'm going to talk about white supremacy or i'm going to talk about you know these very difficult things that i'm always trying to deal with in my poetry that i want to channel my inner tony morrison because I think mm-hmm. that, you know, if she really cared what people thought about her, she wouldn't have said or written the things that she did. So I want to bring that to every moment. Um, but this is hard because, as you point out, it is so easy to keep focusing on the tragedy of it as opposed to the artfulness of it, uh, uh, the the actual sort of craft that goes into making a book that tells a story a a certain way. And I face that with my poems as well. Mm -hmm. You know, it's so easy for people to talk about the content of my poems Mm -hmm. and not what it is I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And so um, this is why it means so much to me that you said those things that you said and that you're talking to me about the making of it. Because I think sometimes people um, assume that if you have a tragic backstory, it just writes itself. Right. That you don't have to do right. anything. Right. Yeah. Oh, I mean, and, and, and you know, because I'm from Mississippi, I laugh at that now, right? I don't know about you, but I have, I have people come up to me all the time and tell me, um, not that they want to write a story or a memoir, but like they want me to write their memoir. Oh. <laughs> and, all, and all they will tell me about their memoir is, you know, it, it, it's some traumatic, tra- tragic event because we right. all to different degrees have those. Yeah. But I just have to let them know in as kind of way as possible, that does not a great book make. Right. Do you know, like the, it, it just doesn't um, to me. But, right. but, but, but in, that, in, that, in that realm, I'm really interested in Okay, so for those of you who will eventually or who have read Memorial Drive, I, I, I don't think it's like hyperbole to say it, it is the most artfully, deftly created memoir mem- that I have ever read. Like, I mean, like, ev- like every single line tells a story if we're willing to listen, right? And 
I'm interested, like that book, I think more than any other book made me think about the limits of like text. So parts of this book are in italics, mm -hmm. including your mom's writing, yep. right? And I'm interested in like, whether or not in your imagination, there would be different kinds of text to use for the different kinds of sort of exchanges you have with the reader in that book. Mm -hmm. um, because, because, because the italics, I always say this, like the italics in that book is, is some way seemingly, I don't think worthy of the language, especially when you get to your, your mom's section, you know? So I don't know, can you, can you just talk to me about italics? This is something I wanted to ask you like 10 years ago. Can you talk to me about italics? <laughs> yeah, you know, in, in there, it really is about sort of these, they're, they're, interruptions they are they are they are the parent there are these these brackets that i have you know and formally structurally and i mean maybe this is where thinking like a poet comes in you know i i was thinking about um you know i, I at the beginning of chapter two i talk about the these bookends mm -hmm. and you know the, this pair of globe bookends um that were that held some of my favorite books on my desk and making this metaphor about how what is, you know, the story that's in between um, those bookends. Um, I needed to find a way to suggest, you know, the years, you know, that I was trying to erase in between there, you know, so all the years before 1973 and then all the years after 1985 and uh -huh. there's that middle part the part that was between those bookends that I wanted to get rid of. So mm -hmm. those I sat, italicized parts are kind of the, the ongoing middle parts that keep interrupting for me the story and are supposed mm -hmm. to help you read like a way that an Ars Poetica might, how to mm -hmm. read what's outside of it. I, um, like I also try to do that with uh, white space. I mean, I had to ask for some of the white spaces that exist um, in the in the book so that I could visually represent silence or restraint or what's not said. Mm. Uh, so I want to uh, ask this last question because I want to make sure we get to Natasha and if you can talk about not just the differences in poetry or prose for you but in the differences you think readers um, approach your poetry versus the way readers have approached this prose. Can you talk about a bit about that? Strangely, I, I feel like m more people are hearing the lyricism of the syntax mm. in this book um, because obviously it's not lineated. I don't have lines, but even when I write poetry, I'm constructing my poems out of sentences that interact with line mm. and line break. And so you're supposed to hear two things at once. You're supposed to hear the rhythm of a line, but also the rhythm of syntax stretched across many lines. Mm. In writing this prose, I didn't have lineation. I only had the lyricism and rhythm of syntax, which is one of my favorite things. I mean, it, even as a poet, I think I'm more, I'm, I'm sometimes more focused on the lyricism of an entire sentence. Yes. Um, and I think people miss that. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think that people reading this prose hear it um, in, in different ways. And, and I'm, I'm grateful for that because, you know, you know, I, just like when I'm tapping my foot to write a poem, I'm tapping my foot to the lyricism and rhythm of a sentence in every sentence in this book. Oh, I need, oh, I wish we recorded that. I need to hear that every day. Thank you. Um, all right, so uh, y'all said y'all wanted to make sure we got time for uh, people's comments and questions. Yeah, I've got a couple of questions here. Okay. 
Um, this is um, for Natasha. It, um, and you referenced this earlier. You, she's uh, Suzanne Cushman, who's a local author. She said, I love what you said, Natasha, about your father who believed, as Robert Frost did, that unless you were at home in the metaphor, unless you have your proper poetical education in the metaphor, you are not safe anywhere. How did your family and your education prepare you for the dangers you would face in life? <laughs> One of the, the biggest ways was, was that right there, you know, to help me understand um, the symbolic, uh, the, you know, what is figurative, what is metaphorical, what is symbolic in our gestures. And, you know, as a black child growing up in Mississippi, there was no place more than I needed to be able to understand the symbolism mm -hmm. everywhere around me because the symbolism everywhere around me in Mississippi was a symbolism meant to um, honor the Confederacy, the lost cause, white supremacy, and to remind me my place in that society. You are not safe in science. You are not safe in history if you don't understand the symbolisms of all of those Confederate symbols around the state of Mississippi. And the symbolism in, you know, what is said and what is not said. Um, there, there are so many silences in, in our home state uh, that make it both rich and fertile ground for truth-telling. Right. Someone, uh, let me see who this is, uh, Katie McClendon. She asked, um, she said, Kiese's question about italics got me thinking about form. I started listening to this with the audiobook. Natasha narrates and hearing her voice with the text feels perfect. But then I wonder what am I missing out visually from the book form? Do, so my question is about how do you approach the text versus audio of a book? Oh, that's a great question. Um, to, to go back to the last thing that uh, Kiese and I were talking about, um, about the lyricism of syntax. I mean, I hope that in reading those sentences out loud, some of the, the music is evident. I mean, in a poem, you might, you would obviously have some lineation to help um, a reader understand where there are natural pauses and, and sejuras in a line. I try to bring those kinds of things to the reading of the audiobook as well. Places where, to use the silly thing, the emphasis on the wrong syllable, <laughs> I want to make sure that you understand the emphasis because I can emphasize, some reader might, might emphasize a different word in a sentence, um, but I'm thinking about the music of that syntax and, and wanting to make sure that that is conveyed in the reading of the book, as well as the white spaces that allow for certain kinds of silences before starting again. Uh, Kiese, the same question is asked to you. Uh, Katie said, I think you could ask Kiesa the same question about the process of writing for text versus for audio. Is it just a bonus when an audio book is its own special piece of art? Yeah, you know, I'm I'm just not, I mean, I'm just not as good yet. You know, I'm trying to get there. I'm trying to get there, but I'm just not as good uh, at writing as Natasha. But I, so when I read my own work, I read it the way I wanted it to sound on the page. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And, um, and that doesn't mean I'm reading it the way I want it to, I want it to be heard by everybody. Cause I think everybody who reads my, my, my plea would be, please read out loud to yourself as well. Mm -hmm. So you can understand your rhythms, you know? Um, but for me, like I, I read my, I read my stuff over and over and over and over again. And even when I did do something like an audio book, what I realized in that, in my audio book was that, I still didn't read it the way I would have read it had I been in a room by myself. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Cause I was in the room with this white dude who was an engineer who was from Utah and mm -hmm. you know what I mean? A whole lot of things are going on next door. There was some weird stuff going on. So um, yeah, for me, I just want to read it the way I, 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 I read it. Right. But it's also, I want to read it the way I wish I could have written it. And, and just because of like my limitation and the limitations of form and, and like prose, I, I sometimes can't do that on the page. Hmm. Hmm. Um, this question is from Michael T. Natasha, your memoir is also about the powerful love your mom had for you and of the woman and artist you are today because of that strong love. Do you see your book as a tribute and a monument to your mom? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I go back to the one of the epigraphs I use uh, from Shakespeare's sonnet number three, thou art thy mother's glass and she in thee calls back the lovely April 
of her prime. You know, writing it, before I wrote it, I, I, I thought I was gonna write a different book. I wanted to write a book in which I did, did the kind of deep archival research that could uh, allow me to write about my mother as if she were a historical figure that I was mm. trying to learn about. Um, so that I could present her fully in that way. There was so much I couldn't know though. And I realized then that I, I wasn't going to be able to write that book, but that what I could show you was something about who my mother was by letting you see who I am. Mm. Thou art thy mother's glass and she in thee calls back the lovely April of her prime. I am indeed her reflection. Um, all right. And then this is from Lemuria. <laughs> when did you decide that you needed to write this memoir? Was it a long process? Or was it something that just flowed out of you? And I was actually curious about that too. Mm -hmm. When, did, when you, did I decide or? Yes, ma'am. When did you decide to write this memoir? Um, um, so I decided to write it, I guess, in 2012. So um, it took me seven years to write it. It took a long time to write it. Um, I decided I needed to write it because there were so many ways with um, my own sort of increasing uh, success as a writer that um, my mother was being erased from the story. Um, it was very easy for people to draw a straight line from my father, who was also a poet, to me. My father, who was also my white parent, to me, as if I were Athena sprung fully formed from his head, mm. um, and not someone who both was shaped and made by her mother and also had to shape and make herself. Um, that is the moment that I decided I needed to write it because she kept being mentioned in my backstory as a kind of footnote or a victim. And I knew that if this was going to continue to happen, I needed to tell her story so that her role in my life and my development as a person and a writer was put into its proper context. I'm a writer because of my mother. Yeah. Um, and this is a uh, question is from Tanja Murphy, the community uh, outreach coordinator for the book festival. And Tanja said, I listened to the audio and the weight of the words, you know, you know, you know, are a weight of self-realization I've never experienced from a book. Can you talk a little about that? Thanks for asking me about that, those, um, that specific line. You know, it, it almost feels to me like, um, a gnashing of my teeth, you know, when I get to it, you know, you know, you know, it is a self indictment. It is, um, a hard realization. Um, it is not, and it's meant to be two things at that moment. It's meant to be, you know, the realization that the fifth grader has the fifth grade Natasha, who, um, has to acknowledge what she knows that is happening in that house, but it is also obviously connected to the lines that come afterward, which are more about the adult Natasha um, having to contend with what I know that I have tried so hard to forget. You know, that's a stand, that's a um, chapter that begins, you remember even though you don't want to. Mm. Um, and it ends, you know, look at you, you know, just you have to, even now you think you can distance yourself. Um, so it's about two realizations at once, you know, the, the child realizing that she's knowing something that's happening and the adult realizing her own complicity in trying to erase and forget with that willed amnesia. Well, that's all the questions that I have gotten um, from the viewers. Does, um, Natasha and Kiese, do y'all have anything else y'all would like to add to this? I mean, one of the things that we said, the way you render your mother, for me, one, made me think about, you know, my mother and my grandmother, and then it made me think about the kind of parent I want to be, 
but 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 then you know after i read it like three times i was like no like her mother is a model for 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 me of of human being as a verb right mm -hmm. like and i don't think one has to be a mother to find models in mothering so i just wanted yeah. to say thank you for that rendering yeah thank you thank you and i i, I wanted to say to you too how much um I was taken with your and your mother's real desire for um, knowledge and for for black excellence, for for that uh, wonderful and overwhelming expectation and burden. They're both powerful. Thank you so much, and thank y'all for coming and. Um, thank y'all for allowing me to ask questions, and Natasha, I wanted to ask ten years ago and. 10 days ago, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you all both so much for coming. I'm sorry, I just, um, this is Tina. It says, hey, Natasha, it's your friend, Tina. I bought <laughs> your book yesterday and I plan to spend the weekend reading it and plan to purchase 12 more copies as gifts. Thanks <laughs> always for your inspiration. And I hope to see you soon and we'll spend the weekend reading it. Oh, thank you, Tina. I, I wish I could be in, in Jackson at the, at the hotel and see you tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Natasha. Thank you. Uncomfortable is a series in the Mississippi Book Festival podcast, Right on Mississippi, which is presented in partnership with Mississippi Public Broadcasting.